Welcome to this week's Vernon Institute. We've got uh, Martin Bola, who is talking to us this week about exploring and patching socio-environmental systems, sense-making, and geoethics. Take it away, Martin. Yes, happy to be here. Uh, funny to say that at a virtual um, medium. Mm -hmm. Today I like to do what the title says. I tr try to bring together certain elements which I'm interested in. It may be a bit heterogeneous, it's work in progress, and uh, so it is exploring, it is patching certain things where I have uh, interest. These slides are also posted on my ResearchGate site, so for those who would like to visit them later, there's a possibility to uh, download them. So, in case of an introduction, to give you four points to which you may attach when you get lost during the flow of the, of the talk, I think you have an idea of what geosciences is, is about. So that is geology, geophysics, oceanography, and many, many other uh, traits. Under the notion human niche, I, people cover all the things which we do in order to build our place on, on Earth, changing the environment, technical systems, and I develop, will develop in this a little bit uh, later. As is something which we build, human decision taking involved, immediately it relates to our value systems. So, and when then comes then an interest in geoethics plays into the into this picture. When we drill a little bit in what in what in terms of systems features a human niche consists, there is this relative demanding notion of the complex adaptive socio environmental systems which I found and took from other, other sources, and we will dig in a little bit what that means in terms of, uh, of content in order to give you uh, a flavor. This is the things which are around you, so you are living in complex adaptive socio environmental systems, and they have, for example, features like pest dependence development. You cannot turn back uh, to things. There are new properties which emerge, and they may behave in a non-expected uh, manner. They are uh, competing notions wicketed for the complex ad adaptive, which different science communities use, and I have found that they have little overlap in terms of the literature which she uh, quote mutually. So, as a first building block, so my current interest is on sense making that was triggered some months ago where I run in a piece of research. I'm interested in environmental systems in a wider sense and I'm interested in how the human being, so the actor, the people who take decisions, be it drive your car or be it a major decision to build something, react. And when I look on uh, these kind of systems, I can on one way uh, dissect they in three elements. So one is the human system and the practices which we have, uh, which go with them. Then are natural systems and processes and the interactions between both part, which we can look as an independent uh, feature. And when digs into that deeper, then comes uh, quite often one runs over notions like open, which means the systems get energy, material, information from outside. Their development is irreversible. That's another word for pest dependency. And there are features which might emerge. And the agents which are acting in this system, so the human beings, play a, have to have to play, play a kind, kind of game, which bump, with some people call, uh, call wicked. And I believe, if one looks into the way how people make collectively sense of their environment, when uh, has it either increase or decrease the chance in order that the games which they have to play in a positive way are simpler or more, com or more complex. Okay, here's a little bit of more detail what uh, these kind of systems may involve. Let's take only up, up some keywords. So they are networks, of course, and effect re relationships, so not single one. We have systems where the inputs and the outputs do not relate proportionally. Uh, different elements of the system may have, 
have in, in certain con situations different functions or the same function is taken over from, from different elements and we may have cascading amplifications uh, of effects. So another cut to uh, what these uh, complex adaptive socio-environmental system means, they have on one side, there are processes that govern fluxes of energy, matter and information as well in natural as in the human parts of, of the system. The second very important element is, is the sense making of people, which people, how people think that the system functions, how they could react, and how this is interpreted in their way to build their, build their niches. And third element, something which my thinking is currently evolving on, is what I run under the label engineered artifacts. This in the end means two things. First, the physical side, how we build things, and second, also the people's understanding and insight of uh, as well the physical systems as well of their sense making. There may be different ways how to group the things. You can, you can check on the, the comment block on this. I would only like to stress in for me an engineered artifact means tools, systems, processes made by humans and the ideas which we have about their purpose and their use. Simple example, uh, an engineered system is a car, including you as a driver, and how you collectively as Brussels car driver behave in rush hour in order to make the most possible and biggest traffic jams which you can have on this, on this continent. That is part of, part of the system, part of the sense making of the driver here. Oh, that was too rapid. So, uh, here's a short list of, of literature from different sources and when you go through the titles you find uh, that people in innovation ecosystems look into these kind of problems, then we have uh, people in administrations, then there are uh, political scientists in uh, climate research, uh, there are environmental management uh, people and there are people in uh, um, development research all look from different angles and using different notions on the same kind of problem and one of my interests is to try to bring these things together and see what are their com com commonalities. So that was one set of building blocks. The second set of building blocks is what is geoethics and I already talked about that uh, some time ago so let's keep it sharp. So geoethics initially was about responsible geosciences, so a kind of prof a concept in, of professional ethics among a group of, of professions. But the discussions in the last years concern more and more so the societal and cultural relevance of geosciences. And when we now take a second look on what geosciences uh, means, uh, this is a big group of research fields, applied and fundamental, including engineering disciplines and commercial un un undertakings, for example, digging a tunnel through the mining. And all these together, they address the way how our globe with 7 billion people on it functions. In the end, geoscience are, is very essential for the intersection between the natural earth systems and the human, human system. If you would like to have a simple example, just think about the soil where your house is, is and somebody has thought about soil mechanics and foundations in order to keep uh, your building building up. So, geoethics initially about conduct of geosciences, the scope is wider, and when, when looks into uh, a little bit from a philosophical point of view, one could qualify geoethics as an actor-centric ethics, which relatively quite plain approaches for many application cases. And when you would like to get a view on it, uh, I copied here what in our community runs as the geoethical promise. And when you go through it, uh, you find common sense. Just pick out one phrase in the middle, I will never misuse my geoscience knowledge resisting constraint and coercion. 
or I will do lifelong learning. And for many disciplines, uh, you would say it's the same. So uh, you take the geoscience out, you take the cultural, keep the virtual values, keep the understanding on it, and it applies to. So therefore, geoethics for me is a lot of common, common sense. So next uh, building block, and this is definitely the most uh, difficult one and complex, and for me the most recent, uh, which I run in early this year, uh, there were people which apply what they call semiotic cultural psychological theory, which is about effective sense making. So sense making of people in pre-semantic uh, forms, so not rationalized writing text, uh, and see, they see this as a process to internalize in individuals and in group the uh, uh, systemic features of the life which they have and express it uh, through a number of things which they call uh, symbolic universe, world views would be a common sense, uh, similar term using something which they call semiotic uh, resources. And I believe that there is, uh, or I like to study it, there is this bit of research may be able to allow to link the first and the second building block which I have. So thinking about system dynamics and thinking about uh, ethical, ethical con concepts. So uh, to deepen a little bit uh, with this in, when we put it in a nice phrase, then man could say the homo semioticus, so compared to the homo economicus, is an agent which is rational, yes, but within the constraints of two fundamental needs to keep one's world views, symbolic universe, first stable and coherent within the cultural milieu where the person is living in, and working as a uh, mechanism to interpret the experience which one makes in a, in a common sense. When I found that, I asked myself the question, if we then now have one of these complex adaptive systems and there are different actors in it which have different worldviews, so operate in different symbolic universe because they have a different way of sense making, uh, they may pull in very different directions and then uh, causing in these systems uh, processes to start which uh, enter into conflict which is, which is other. So I saw a sense in looking into how the sense making, if it is better understood, the mutual sense making, might facilitate our action, our activities in our day-to-day -day environment in this complex adaptive social environmental uh, systems. So, as an interruption, don't try to understand the details, they have no meaning, but uh, I try to illustrate graphically uh, when you are, have uh, two different set of semiotic resources, so the nice part in the center of the picture, and you get the same set of inputs from the left, so somebody uh, walking under the rain rainbow, how you interpret this into a uh, different universe. One, uh, answer would be yes, a little bit cloudy under this sunshine, and the other said, okay, rain is falling and I have uh, difficulties. And that is, these concepts are taken from study which look in, in Europe, across the continent, how people make sense of their wide political social environment, which find it as caring, one type of the symbolic universe or find it as uh, challenging, including uh, to uh, develop xenophobic uh, attitudes. So what I would not like to do is try to patch these different things uh, together and I will not go here through the details where it takes the different elements from the, from the studies and jump immediately to a tool which I borrowed from somewhere Ads. Hi, stop, I forgot something. What we may need in the uh, 
in the following. Part of these this studies there is that they identified two drivers which uh, irritate people, to put it simple. That first is the opacity, that they call this opacity, and the second thing they call the hyper connectivity of social life, which irritate many people, at least in Europe, and cause a, a worldview where the others are perceived as dangerous, threatening, against which one has to uh, defend uh, each other's. So, my standard examples for these kind of complex adapted social environmental systems, taking from my background, small scale fisheries and seabed mining, uh, which are both in the marine environment, the common features, multi actor, one in, is an artisanal activity, the other is an industrial ac activity, both face in the environment, environmental, strong environmental pressures. Uh, and there's a certain number of technological, technological risks uh, involved with both of, both of them. So both of these systems fall in this, examples fall in this category. And I look for a means uh, how to describe them in a common, common matter, drawing on the system features, drawing on sense making, and drawing on this particular element that uh, I see in the engineered artifacts, so the tools and processes and systems which we make, which on one way are guide our intervention into natural and human systems, and on the other side are loaded with uh, purpose are loaded with sense making and uh, we give them and their use case are important and engineering of things is done in one way or another depending on the purpose which we give and depending on the use case which we have you can think about the big hydro power hydro uh, power installations for generating energy or for providing drinking or irrigating water, you can uh, think of uh, transport um, systems. All these engineered systems are not only the material side which we see easily, but they have all an overload of uh, purpose sense making. So what I took, and this is a didactic slide, because you will have a little bit of this kind of presentations uh, in the next minutes. So you see there a cube, the cube is formed with three axes, A, B, C, and uh, imagine certain uh, values given to along this axis from zero at the origin to a maximum value at the, at the corner. You could then uh, conceive that the corners of this presentation are certain ideal types, so things are very characteristic, and the real world is somewhere in the volume. And in the following, I will play on the ideal types and simply say, okay, in the real world, I've captured somewhere in the volume, even if I don't know where it is in a given case exactly placed. So the first thing still on a more didactic mode. So if you assume we put on the three axes, first, the abundance of shared adequate knowledge. I use this wording because I need it uh, later. So with abundance is very low to the or origin and is maximum to the point uh, to the right down corner. On the other, on the next axis, you put physical features, whether dynamics are nonlinear or not. So from non-linear, non so to very nonlinear. And you put on the, the third axis, the culture diversity of the agents different backgrounds, different language, whatever can play into it. And uh, then you can immediately see when you are in the uh, lower right corner, you will have a system where people have abundance of knowledge, cultural diversity is very, very low, and processes are very linear, so not non-linear, so the world is simple. We know a lot, we agree easily, and we have a system to uh, tackle what is quite straightforward. 
when you go to the top left corner, uh, knowledge is very, very limited. Dynamics are very nonlinear and cultural diversity of agents is very high. So we don't understand what is happening. We don't understand each other because our culture is, is so different. And on top of this, we have a, a system in front of us which does any strange things where we have difficulties to imagine that is happening. So this is for the didactic. And that can be now uh, applied, this kind of presentation, first looking into dynamics of systems. So again, these three axes. Now on this axis are different uh, properties plotted. So on the uh, horizontal axis is, can I uh, decompose the system in discernible parts? But normally in an engineering approaches, a car exists out of wheels, engine, brakes, and this is all separate parts. And, and, and I can go finer and finer in it. The system can be decomposed. Uh, then I need two other features on the axis in the depth of the picture, the degree of nonlinearity, because nonlinearity is the feature of uh, dynamics which hinders in the end that I give you a small nudge and you only move a little bit. A nonlinear system can have features I give you a uh, small nudge and big bang. I give you a nudge and a nudge and a nudge and a nudge and, a nudge and nothing happens, the other possibility. And the, the next feature which I need is the uh, degrees of positive feedback, so self-amplification and not damping of events which is happening. So and then can, can I again look into this picture, which kind of uh, dynamics I have on the bottom right corner, I have many discernible parts, so I can decompose the system in simple bits which I can treat. I can put a new wheel on my car and see, I can inf uh, inflate the tire and, and it's done, the car drives again. I have no positive uh, uh, feedback lobes, so the system is not set amplifying. And I have very linear processes, so I can be certain a small nudge, a small reaction, a strong nudge, a strong strong direction. So I would there in the bottom right corner, I have systems where I feel comfortable, my intuition tells me rightly how it will behave next, and I don't have any uh, bigger surprises. When I go to the opposite corner and the opposite si situation, first I have a system which I cannot decompose. Huh? If I decompose this, I, des I destroy its features. A lot of positive feedbacks, so a lot of ampli self amplifying is possible, and I have the nonlinear dynamics which hinders uh, me to have this uh, nice proportionality between inputs and uh, output. So, uh, when I say on the bottom right, these are intuitive systems which behave as I expect, I get a lot of surprises in the top left corner. And there is just where these complex adaptive socio environmental systems are sitting when the complexity and the adaptive features are, uh, are strong. So now I can take a different look in the same presentation on another element of, and that is uh, inspired by Daniel Dennett, and you have the source on the left front of the, of the picture. He looked into... Uh, he have plotted three things. First, on the horizontal X, the fidelity of the transmission of the cultural heritage. So is um, a certain degree, you could say, high fidelity, very conservative. We do as our parents did. We do as our peer tells us. We copy them one to one. We have a system which does not allow to deviate from, from these lessons which are gone. Then on the x-axis, on the vertical axis, I put up the roughness of the cultural landscape, which reflects uh, how similar your neighbor or the other agent or other parts of your in, in environment is to you. Or if it is rough, differences are strong. If it is uh, not so rough, differences are little. And you can immediately, and then on the axis in the depth of the shield, you have the rate of incoming change from outside. So what, what is a driver which hits 
on, on me and my system. Now the key question is, where should I be situated to be fit to what is happening? And then comes immediately to, uh, into inside, when I am on the bottom right corner, I have a high fidelity uh, of, of the system and a smooth culture length shelf and no incoming change. Very quantitative situation. I can continue as in the past forward. But when I then this system get driven by the income and change out of this point and you move to the uh, backward right corner, uh, where a lot of change is coming into the system and you are taught to do things as your, as your fathers did, as your neighbors did, you're possibly unfit. You're not able to cope with the, uh, with the uh, change. So, ah, did I miss one? This, that, yeah. Uh, now I bring into the same presentation the one element which comes from these people who looked in these cultural processes, and I think there is some uh, benefit of in replacing on one x the word with the uh, the word culture with the word semiotic heritage. So what I get as sense making means communicated it is sharper as notion, sharper as notion as the notion culture. And the symbolic uh, landscape uh, replaces uh, on the other axis. Basically, the reflection is the same as in the previous uh, slide, only playing there using their different different notions. So now you remember maybe the first box and to the last box. And I now I do what physical trained people do once in a while. I com I uh, compact dimensions and again play with three. So all my systems dynamics I have now on the axis labeled counterintuitive system behavior. So from low to high. And I have the abundance of the available knowledge and I have my sharing sense making on the vertical, vertical axis. So again, I have three features. And when I look on the system uh, classifications, I identify now in the top uh, left corner, I have a low counterintuitive uh, system behavior. So the system is nice with me. I have a lot, a high level of shared sense making among a different uh, people and have a high abundance of knowledge. So I'm an excellent uh, position in order to act in a meaningful manner in that system. I know I can trust and the system behaves uh, nicely, to put it that, that way. When I go from this corner in the opposite uh, place, there I have little knowledge, counterintuitive system behavior, and I have a low level of shared sense making. So I'm alone as actor, in the sense that I do not really understand what my neighboring actor is doing. I don't understand really what is happening, and the system goes weird. So the, I'm there, what then people call in a wicked situation and a difficult uh, game to play. So now we have one interesting uh, feature. When one looks on real situation, one finds good indication that the shared sense making and the abundance of knowledge are two parameters which are not really independent, but which relate in one way to another. And therefore I have the dotted blue uh, corp in this uh, in this picture. This allows me to go from a three-dimensional presentation in a two-dimensional present presentation. So repeating what I uh, we had had so far, we have on one axis the abundance of available knowledge and the shared sense making. On the other axis, the counterintuitive system behavior. And again, I can open a space from the most wicked to the most tame situation for the uh, actor. So I plug in the, rem the other elements uh, which I studied so far in this slide. So uh, I this, for example, when I have system features which are characteristic by sudden changes, 
irreducible uncertainty, unlimited concerns, change over time, unproductive interactions, technations, scale interactions, what I find in many, many systems, then I'm in the corner of the wicketed uh, games. And uh, I have to accept that because it's, uh, it's a system feature. And bringing my examples in, the small scale fisheries and the seabed mining are in that, uh, in that corner. Uh, and I think two, two remarks now. Uh, our normal approach through engineering, blueprints, administration works for tame games only and not in wicketed games. So the question is, what can I do? And I think we have a fair chance in, to work on the two other parameters, on the available knowledge and on the shared sense making. And the shared sense making means in the end, we need governance uh, approaches which are of participatory nature. So uh, again, a look then, what does it mean? Different governance approaches, the three axes, and this is taken from work of uh, Kovac and, uh, and co colleagues, where the three elements, capacity building, empowerment of agents, and space for deliberation and uh, representation. And then again, we can open a space in which we see we have the most top-down system in the bottom left corner and the most participatory system in the top right. So, summarizing a bit, uh, when one looks from these different angles on uh, these kind of systems we are interested in, the fact that the behavior is wicketed or complex and adaptive, be it for natural, social, or governmental system, is an intrinsic feature, not a dysfunction. I think this is very important to capture. Uh, um, it is not that we see something which should not behave as it should. No, it behaves that it is. And the question is, what are the kinds of means which we have in order to tackle it? And one way to tackle this situation is to strengthen uh, governance in a sense that it allows for um, multi-agent, common sense making processes. So what comes now uh, in more or less illustrative uh, slides is just illustrating what could that mean in practice. A normal situation which we face quite often you find on this slide which you have here. So as a very strong top-down processes, uh, implementation modes, which were learned from Thames Games, very limited uh, place for having bottom-up activities and the building blocks of the uh, system interact as they like and there's little, in quotes, pressure in order to get them interacting in a meaningful man manner. So the first uh, thing to do is to get uh, both sides of the balance in equal strengths. And that is, for example, something which I found in, uh, in, in regional development in Finland where they designed uh, systems in a, in a different way. So that is a certain approach that top-down measures are scaled down, they're weaker, they're more bearings than guidance, bottom-up processes should gain their importance in order to provide an environment that the different buildings block of the systems can easier and more meaning meaningful to inter interact. And then is the question whether one can bring in additional uh, means in order to help the shared sense making. And I think that there is in this effective uh, sense making approach, there is resources on which one can look in order to see how the uh, age, different agents can interact in a meaningful manner. So narrowing for summarizing, complex adapt, adaptive social environmental system exits three dimensions of distinct features and to put genetic pressure and commercial expo exploitation, explo exposure to invent, environmental hazards and technological risks that I didn't study in this talk a lot, 
They have multi-level governance, multi-level regulations, and multi-faceted uh, sense-making. And my question is how one can address this third element. And I come to the finding that agents in such systems certainly would benefit from having a one common element in their sense-making. And when we look on these systems, which I am interested in, then certainly geoethics could offer a common basis for agents coming from otherwise different culture in order to react in a manner, in, in a manner which is aligned without being formally coordinated. When you are manager of an artisanal fishing area in Senegal, uh, by no means you can coordinate with uh, the, your national government which decides the international treaty on uh, commercial fishings in the same zone. So, taking home measures, um, sense making of uh, agents certainly shapes the building of the human human niche through the intervention in the uh, in these systems which make up the human niche. A common meta order would be helpful for a common uh, shared sense making of agents. So when they intervene in different functions of the same system, which are uh, then is communicating their intervention throughout the system. Uh, geoethics, to my understanding, offers for this socio-environmental system an element for such a meta order. And finally, agents, meaning you, me, as people who live in certain systems, or on the other side, people who are tasks in administrations, business, could benefit from having a common ethical uh, basis for their interactions in that system. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope it was not uh, too long, but certainly it was a complex matter. Thanks for your patience.